Well, they said everything with the advent candle that I was going to say, so you're dismissed. <laughs> I was sitting there. It's like I should have read that thing that Jenna was going to read, uh, Josh was going to read, because that was, actually. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Mark asked me a couple months ago to, uh, to fill in for him. He's, he's uh, up in Michigan. And uh, so I started preparing a message. And I get a text from him saying, well, that's, that's Advent. And, and it, we're lighting the candle of hope. And it's like, oh, okay. I, I, I think it can work. I think it can work. Then it dawned on me. It's like, well, the Advent thing. Uh, so I grew up in, in Southern Baptist churches. And every church that I ever attended, belonged to, we never did Advent. And we've been doing Advents, you know, recognizing Advent here. But it dawned on me, I have no idea what that is. You know, and, and how many have ever, you know, you've gone through the Advent, but you're thinking, what does that all mean? You, I mean, be honest. You, you can raise your hand. Okay, see. You know, and, and we were talking uh, in the pastor's office, and Bob said the same thing. He said, I never did it until we were here, you know. And I, and I kind of like to know, because it's, it's kind of like the... the the young couple where, where the wife wanted to have the family in for, for the Thanksgiving dinner and uh, the husband came in, the new husband came in to the kitchen and as she was putting the ham in the pan. He goes, no, you're doing it wrong. She goes, what are you talking about? And, and guys, if you, if you haven't ever said this, you're not married, don't ever say this. That's not the way my mom did it. Not a good thing. You know, you're doing it wrong. Well, why did mom do it then? Well, I'm not sure. You know, and they will argue for a while. So he went and got his mother and come in and, and said, Mom, she's doing it wrong. She goes, yeah, you're doing it wrong. You're supposed to cut the end of the ham off before we put it in the pan. She's like, why am I supposed to do this? She goes, well, that's the way my mother always did it. So they went and got grandma, brought her in. They said, she's doing it wrong. You know, we told her you're supposed to cut the end of the ham off before you cook it. Why did you always do that? She goes, well, because my pan wasn't big enough. <laughs> so I had to cut it off, okay? So, so I looked it up. Advent, you know, in case you're wondering, uh, and some use a wreath. We have the four candles around it and, and the white candle in the middle. And, and some put a, a wreath around it. And the wreath is a symbol of God. There is no beginning and no end to God. It's just, you know... And, and, and the green is the, the new life, the new beginning. Okay? And the cam candles symbolize the light of God coming in the world through the birth of his son. And we have four candles around, which represent the 400 years between Malachi and Christ's birth of waiting and anticipating. Advent is a symbol of, of waiting, of hope, of, of, of the coming of Christ. And the, and the colors of the candles vary. You know, they have sometimes, it, it says, an official color of Advent, purple, but some may use pink and some may, you know, or blue. And the light of the candle itself becomes an important symbol of the season. The light reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world that comes into the darkness. And it also reminds us that you are the light of the world. Okay? There's not going to be a test on this, by the way. This is all free. This is you're not paying for this. This, of course, the rest of it's free too. But you know, and I guarantee you, it'd be worth every penny you pay. Okay, first candle, as we said, is hope, and it, and it's not like the hope, you know, like I don't. I hope I, you know, don't trip over these mic cords. I, I hope I don't fall down these steps. I hope my papers don't fall off. The pulpit, I hope I don't get so nervous that I throw up. And you're probably thinking, I hope he doesn't get so nervous that he throws up. But those first two things were kind of funny. That might be entertaining. Okay, it's, it's a hope that's built on something. Of, of, of something that's on the, from the past. Something you can trust. Genuine hope must be founded on something or someone. Which affords reasonable grounds for confidence of fulfillment. The Bible bases its hope in God and his saving acts. Okay? So it's not a, 
It's not a, a hope. I hope he doesn't talk a long time because I've got a roast in the oven and it's going to burn if he gets long-winded. Okay, there's no foundation for that hope. Okay, plan on going to Applebee's. Okay. So, so as I was doing this, and, and so, okay, we got this message, and, and, and I picked Second Kings, the story of Naaman. Okay, it's, it's not a traditional Christmas story. We're talking about a Syrian general with leprosy. Okay, it's not what you think about when you think about Christmas. But it works with hope because the Bible is a book filled with stories of people that have no hope. But the Bible is a book that reveals the true hope of the world. Okay, so it worked out. And then I get a text from him. It says, uh, are you doing a theme? And it's like, a theme? Well, Christmas, is it a, you know, you're going to use a Christmas movie, a Christmas special, a Christmas song. Okay, go, and, and like all good theologians today, I Googled. Okay. <laughs> Christmas movies. Do you know how many Christmas movies there are? Do you know how many Christmas TV specials there are? The Twilight Zone had a Christmas special. <laughs> the Simpsons have several, you know, uh, Christmas songs. And, and most of the, and go to Hallmark Channel. Anybody watch the Hallmark Channel? It, Hallmark Channel, the Christmas movies are always somebody falls in love with somebody they didn't expect to fall in love with. Okay, that's what their Christmas stories are about. Christmas movies about you know we have the Christmas Carol. How many enjoy the Christmas Carol? Okay, who's your favorite Scrooge? <laughs> George C. Scott. Mine is. Uh, uh, I lost it. Oh well. <laughs> and, or, or, and it's always about the Christmas magic. The magic of Christmas. We hear about the magic of Christmas. You know, people's lives are changed because of Christmas. You know, where, where we have somebody that's just hard to, to love, and it's just a rotten person, like, like in the Christmas carol, and through the magic of Christmas, his life is changed. And a lot of the Christmas movies are that way, on that theme, because of the magic of Christmas. There is no magic of Christmas. Okay? The, it, it's just, it's, here it is. Because of Christmas, this happens. No, that's not the way it works. You know? So, and then I got to thinking about Christmas songs. Okay? Grandma got ran over by a reindeer. <laughs> Won't fit. Okay? Uh, the, the barking dogs, Christmas, you know, jingle bells, and, and that didn't work. Okay? But I did, and, and he also asked me, he texts me, he says, do you have any hunting analogies? You know, I, I, I guess he thinks I'm kind of one, you know, one track mind. You know, I can talk about fishing too. So, you know, I, I'm not just one track mind. Okay. But then I thought about one of my favorite songs. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And it truly is. But, but it seems like it starts earlier and early. You ever notice that? I mean, it used to be just like December and then it moved into uh, November, you know. And now, dove season starts on September 1st. And then bow season starts on September 15th. And it is a wonderful time of the year, you know. And then, <laughs> end of October, or in October, we have rabbit season. And we have uh, early goose season. And then at the end of October, duck season starts. And then we have uh, deer season in November. And, and Thanksgiving weekend, goose season starts back up. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And it goes through January. You know, I don't think that's what the song is about. But for me it is. You know, this, this is, it's, it's like six months long. You know, the most wonderful time of the year. But so I, I picked Naaman. Because... I love this story. I, it's like I said, it's not a, a traditional Christmas story when you think about it. But it is man that is faced with a situation where he has absolutely no hope. Okay. 
You think about situations. Everybody is in a position in one time in their life when it seems there is absolutely no hope, whether it's disease or economic situations or whatever. And, and I looked this up, and this is from a book, Hope in the Age of Anxiety, a Guide to Understanding and Strengthening Our Most Important Virtue it's by Anthony Scioli and, and Henry B. Biller. And it's, I, I, it's an excerpt from their book on psychcentral.com. The nine types of homelessness, uh, hopelessness. Alienation. When it doesn't seem like anybody cares about you. You're all alone. See if you've ever felt this way before. Forsakenness. Total abandonment that leaves individuals feeling alone in their time of greatest need. Uninspired. Powerlessness. Powerlessness. Oppression. Limitedness. Doom. Captivity. Helplessness. Nine time types of, of hopelessness. And, and I don't know. I mean, if, you, if you're experiencing it now or if you haven't ever experienced it before, you know what I'm talking about. With, where there is no hope. And you're looking at it and you have no hope. Well, open your Bibles to Second Kings chapter 5. And you can use all the cliches you want to talk about hopelessness at the end of your rope. The walls are closing in. You know? And, 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 and it's not a respecter of persons' hopelessness. Okay. Wealthy people experience hopelessness. Celebrities experience hopelessness. I went and did a search on celebrities and famous people that have committed suicide because there was absolutely no hopelessness. I didn't know that Sigmund Freud committed suicide. He had uh, throat cancer. And... Uh, but with, with all those, and I, and I felt it actually when, when I got all these texts because I was thinking all these, all these uh, movies and, and, and specials and, and, and songs, and it's like, good grief, what could I use? And, and for you older people, and maybe some of you younger ones, when you hear good grief, what's the next two words you think of? Charlie Brown. Good grief. I mean, here's poor Charlie Brown. I mean, he means well. He tries hard. He, you know. But it seems like there is no hope for him. It's like this video right here. <laughs> good grief. I really did. It's like, good grief. What am I? We're back. stupid Charlie Brown. What kind of a tree is that? You are supposed to get a good tree. Can't you even tell a good tree from a poor tree? I told you he'd goof it up. He's not the kind you can depend on to do anything right. You're hopeless, Charlie Brown. Completely hopeless. Rat! You've been dumb before, Charlie Brown, but this time you really did it. Have you ever felt like that? Where it's like, it doesn't matter what I do. It's, it's just, it doesn't work. Charlie Brown, oh Charlie Brown. I can't believe it. She must think I'm the most stupid person alive. Come on, Charlie Brown. I'll hold the ball and you kick it. Hold it. Ha! You'll pull it away and I'll land flat on my back and kill myself. 
for Charlie Brown. It's Thanksgiving. What's that got to do with anything? Well, one of the greatest traditions we have is the Thanksgiving Day football game. And the biggest, most important tradition of all is the kicking off of the football. Is that right? Absolutely. Come on, Charlie Brown. It's a big honor for you. Well, if it's that important, a person should never turn down a big honor. Maybe I should do it. Besides, she wouldn't try to trick me on a traditional holiday. This time I'm gonna kick that football clear to the moon! Isn't it peculiar, Charlie Brown, how some traditions just slowly fade away? The second one is actually from uh, Charlie Brown Thanksgiving, and I think there's probably another clip in where he tries to kick the football. You know, and you think about it when we when we rely on other people for our source of hope or other things for our source of hope. That's what it looks like when we try to rely on tradition. That's what it looks like. We're putting our hope in that. Remember, we got to we trust. It's got to fall back on on the on the, the very basis of hope is something you can trust, something that's proven in the past that we can prove in the future. And we can trust on that, and we can put our hope on it. First point, we are all in need of hope. Look at verse 1, 2 Kings chapter 5. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram, which was Syria. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier. Okay, the Lord had even blessed him for victory. And guess where some of that victory was? It was over Israel. But the Lord had blessed him. He was a mighty man. He was a wealthy man. He had a lot of power. He was, he was an important man in Syria. But, and as we look on, on, on our lives and, and, and people around us that we seem to think have it all together, there's always... But there's something. Okay. And for every one of us, that but is sin. Okay. He had, Naaman had leprosy. His but, he had leprosy, which was not just a medical condition, but it had social implications. It, and, and, and he had to, you know, People didn't want to be around him. And it lessened his, his power and it lessened everything in his life. And if you think about it, given what he had and then having leprosy, there is probably the lowest servant in Syria that would not have traded places with Naaman. And I looked it up and, 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 and it starts out as a, as a red spot, small red spots. And it grows and it turns white and, and it spreads and it spreads till your fingernails fall out and your toenails fall off and then your toes fall off and your fingers fall off and basically your body rots away until you die a very painful death. And you, if you had it then, true leprosy, because there are a lot of things that could have been considered leprosy, but if you had true leprosy, there was no hope for you. It was a death sentence. But if you look at what sin does to our lives, sometimes it just starts out small. And it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And it, and it can destroy you if you let it go. Now today, they, ha they actually have cure for leprosy. But you really need to get it as early as possible because it will leave permanent nerve damage. Okay, it's, it, once all those things die off, it, it, they're not coming back. The sin is the same way. Jesus is a cure. You have to get it early. Okay, it, because left untreated, there is no hope. 
Jesus is the cure. Jesus is the hope. But Naaman also had a glimmer of hope. Point number two, verse, second verse, third verse. Now bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see a prophet who is in, Sma- who is in Samaria, he would cure him of leprosy. Think about it. This is the way God works. Naaman is a powerful general. Part of his strategy, he would send out bands in countries around them and they'd just raid and they'd bring back whatever they captured, including people. And uh, in that was a girl from Israel. She was a captive. She was a slave girl. But she had compassion for her master. She was a, and she said, if only he would go see the prophet. Okay. She knew where he could find hope. Okay. Are you spreading hope? If you see someone that is totally hopeless, do you spread hope? And in uh, Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 7. He talks about the Israel, the Jews in, in, in Babylon, in captivity, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. She was doing this before Jeremiah ever said that. She was giving him just a little bit of hope. Because I'm sure that, that, that he had exhausted everything else. You know, the, the, the gods of, of Syria, and, and it just hadn't worked. So he listened to her. So he went searching for hope. Verse 4. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means go, the king of Aram replied, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothes. The letter he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. If you look at that amount, I I went and and did the figures of of what that in today's market would be, the gold and just the silver, and it's like $3.2 million dollars. That's what he took with him to buy a cure. And the king, king, he thought highly of him. He said, go, take this letter. You know, I'll send this letter to the, the king of Israel, you know, introducing you and, and asking you to cure you. And he went searching, and first he went to the king of Israel. And there's probably some very good reasons. I mean, here he was. He was traveling with his army, basically. When you consider how much money he was taking, I, I'd travel with an army too. Okay, so he's entering this country. So yeah, he went to the king one to say, you know, I'm not here to wipe you out, but also to impress, and I'm bringing this money to pay you to cure me. And, and I like the uh, the response of the king of Israel. And this is, you know, in the next verse. He talks to the king of Israel. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robe and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to be me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. Okay. Here's the king of Israel, God's chosen people. It wasn't like prophets were this unknown thing in Israel. But his response meant that he was not, had no clue. You know, he was not even thinking about God. He was not thinking about God's prophet. To the point that they don't even name him. They just said the king of Israel. He's that unimportant because he didn't even, he wasn't even thinking about God. He was, he was worshiping other gods. 
you know, when we can go through and figure out who the king was. But at this point, it doesn't matter. He, had a, he didn't have a clue. So Elisha, when Elisha, the man of God, heard the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him a message. Why have you torn your, torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. Because obviously you don't. You know, that could be left unsaid. It could have been said. You know, it's like, you don't know that there's a prophet in Israel. Even though, you know, I, he's constantly giving him help and advice. But obviously you're not even thinking of that. So this man will actually know that there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. So he didn't, he didn't, he, here he comes with the chariots and horses and all his power and all his splendor and all his might. Coming to impress Elisha, cure me. And he was, and he was relying on his power and his prestige and all that. But then again, we, we, we rely on a lot of, we put our hope in so many different things. You know, he put his hope in. Basically, in his, his position, his power. Okay, so I'm going I'm to take a little survey here. If you can, stand up. If you can't, just raise your hand. And how many are not really into raising their hand? <laughs> it's either all of you or none of you. I'm not sure which, but stand up. You know, I could do this the easy way, you know, and just say, okay, if you're going to rely on yourself, everybody sin, sit down, you know. But I'm not going to do that. I'm just, that, that would be too simple. Okay. If anybody has ever buttoned their shirt crooked, sit down. <laughs> and you're going to rely on yourself. You can't even get dressed right. <laughs> but that was, I had more questions. Wow, that was too easy. And I didn't, I didn't even have to go to two or three questions. That was, that was amazing. Okay, Now, if you're relying on another person for your hope, turn your head and look at your neighbor. They sat down too. Okay, So we can exclude that. It's like if, if you're going to place your hope in yourself or somebody else, they can't even get dressed right. Okay? Church. Sometimes uh, people, if I go to church, that'll be it. That'll be it, church. Okay, but we look in the New Testament, we look at Andrew. What was Andrew, when you read about Andrew, what was he doing? He was bringing people to Jesus. He was not bringing people to church. Granted, if you bring people to church, hopefully they'll hear about Jesus. And, and I know they will in this, in this church. Okay? But church is not the answer. Religion is not the answer. Okay? If, you, if you look at some, how some religions have changed and adopt, adapted, and, and, and you can't rely on, on, on the, that. Or traditions. On traditions. It's amazing how some traditions you know, fade away. Christmas. You know the the, the, the importance of Chris, Christmas as we, as we talk about hope. It's, it goes back to that basis of hope, of God proving you know of, of something that was in the past that was true and, and, and was faithful, and you can rely on that for the future. God said, because. Israel was waiting hundreds and hundreds of years for their Messiah. And God said, this is where it's going to happen. This is going to, how it's going to happen. This is what to look for. And all of those things that God said, this is what it's going to be like. This is what his, what his uh, ministry is going to be like. This is what to look for. All those things... God did. 
And when it comes to the hope of Christmas, he said that this is the way it is. He made it happen that way. He said, you can trust me because this is what I'm saying is going to happen later. He's already proven that he can be trusted. So when you're searching for hope, where are you searching? Responding to hope. I love what what, what Elisha did. He didn't get caught up in all the, the, the chariots and the horses and, and go out to pay honor to a man. Elisha knew what was going to happen. He already knew when he said, hey, send them to me. I'll take care of it. That way he knows that there is prophet in Israel and this is the Lord I serve. He sends his servant. Servant says... This is what the prophet said. He didn't even go down there. He didn't go to the door. (laughs) He said, Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. And Naaman went, Yes, I finally got it. I'm finally going to be cured. That that is so simple. Uh Uh-uh. Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Could not wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Not only did he not come and see me, he did not lay hands on me. He didn't even wave his hands over me, make some big production of it, if, I, if all I had to do was wash in a river, I, I got cleaner rivers to wash in. Better rivers. And he went right, way mad. But look at this. Don't, this is the message of Christ. They'd waited 400, 500 years, been waiting hundreds and hundreds of years for the coming of the Messiah. God had already said, this is the way it's going to be. This is what's going to happen. This is where it's going to happen. And when, it, when he came, they said, no, can't be. You know, it's like he's going to be called a Nazarene. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay. This is, I'm, he's not going to be a military leader. This is what his message is going to be. And this is what his message was, and they rejected him. Okay. But we also... He gave us a very, very simple message. And it's a very simple way. Romans 10.9. You want to know what it takes? You don't have to follow a lot of rules. You don't have to go through some huge ceremony, some huge training. This is what you got to do. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's not real tough. But people reject it. Why do they reject it? There's only a couple things for me to do. Believe and confess. But what if I, you know, give a lot of money to church? No, I doesn't say that. What if I do a lot of good things in the community? It doesn't say that. What if I attend church every day? No, it doesn't say that. Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart. And people reject that message because it's way too simple. And they get upset sometimes when you tell them that. Because obviously... We don't know what we're talking about. Sorry about that. Forgot that was there. There's got to be more. There's got to be more. It's too simple. Okay. I, I once heard an interview. Uh, I was at a, at a seminar where Lou Holtz 
who uh, at the time was the uh, coach of Arkansas football team. And he was talking about it. He was on one of these pregame shows. And uh, the announcer asked the coach, the opposing coach, is like, well, you know, what are you going to do to, you know, to win this game? And he went through this whole thing. And well, in the first quarter, half, we're going to do this. And we're going to do this. And hopefully we'll do this and we'll do this. And in the second half, we're going to do this. And they turned to Lou Holtz after this guy got done. And he said, well, what's your game plan? He says, to win. <laughs> well, how are you planning on doing that? Score more than them. Okay? He kept it simple. That's what God does. He, he, t- he calls a sheep. He's got to keep it simple. Think about that. Ask Bob. If you, if you don't know how, how brilliant sheep are, ask Bob. He'll tell you. Okay? He's got to keep it simple. Naaman went away mad. He was angry. How dare him? We should have a big ceremony. I love this. This is where the second second servant that loved and cared for for Naaman comes in. Okay, he gave him. God gave him a second chance. First one was the servant girl said, told him, Naaman's wife, if only my master would go to Samaria and find the prophet, and he'd be clean. We have another servant. God gave him a second chance. I love this. I could give it the uh, Rob Duran paraphrase version, and I will right after this. Name and servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you, do some great thing, would you have not done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So, so this is what, and, and this is kind of bold for the servant, you know, to tell the general this. But he said it with respect. He said, My father. But this is what he said in the, in the Rob Dern paraphrase version. Why don't you just do what he said? Just do what the man said. So I love this story. It's like it's so simple, you know. And, and, and the people is like another person. You might not first, you know, uh, helping somebody and, and, and witnessing to them. And, and they might not... Take in what you've said. But somebody else might come along later and, and, and say it. And it's like, you know what? Because he had exhausted his possibilities and his chances back in Syria. Why else would he travel all this way? And that's essentially what this guy was saying. You came all this way. Why don't you just try it? What harm is it going to do? Other than you, you've got to be wet. You know, if it doesn't work, all you're going to be is wet. But if it works. So, so when, when he said that, Naaman humbled himself this time. Which is the way that we need to come to God. Humbled. So he went down, dipped himself in the Jordan seven times. As the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. He humbled himself and said, yeah. And he came up and he was clean and his life was changed and it was changed enough that Jesus talked about it. And I don't have this scripture up here, but in Luke chapter 4, verse 27... It talks about it because Jesus, where he, when he was back at home, he wasn't performing miracles. And this is where he said, you know, a prophet in his own home has no honor. You know, Elisha was not doing miracles at this time, except for one in the chapter before. And no one was getting cured of a leprosy but Naaman. And if you think about the, 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 the story of, of, of we're unclean, we're under a death sentence. And it's not just this body. It is eternal. And God sent 
his Messiah, his Savior, into this world. And he was rejected because it wasn't what people were expecting. And it's still not what some people are thinking. And they're looking everywhere. They're going around looking for this and looking for this. They're placing their hope in this. But if we humble ourselves, like Naaman did, call on the name of the Lord, confess with their mouth, believe in our heart, we'll be saved. And that's where the hope is, the source of hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Naaman found the source of hope. Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before them. Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He found the source of hope. Second Corinthians. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that if all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. I don't think I did that right. Oh, well. Oh, I'm sorry. That was my mistake. I entered that. It's Second Corinthians. I'm sorry. See, that's what you get for letting the video guy mess with the PowerPoint. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. Oh, you got it? Okay. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death, but that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly pow- peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Ephesians. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And on the source of hope, I, I, I didn't write a lot. I, I, I figured the word of Lord, uh, word of God, t- didn't need my help. Second Thessalonians. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Titus. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works and us and righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So being justified by his grace, we may become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus Christ is the, is the source of hope. It's not Jesus, the little baby in the manger where so many people leave him. You know, it's a good thing. We, we have all these where they talk about Jesus in the manger. Jesus grew up. Jesus had a ministry. His ministry was rejected. He was crucified. But he didn't stay on the cross either. He was buried. He didn't stay in the grave. Our hope in Jesus Christ is a risen Savior. And that's the only hope we have. Does that mean he's going to cure your diseases? Maybe. Does that mean he's going to bring you out of the economic troubles that you're in? Maybe. I don't know. That's between you and him. But without him, I do know this. You have no hope. You have no hope of eternal life. You have no hope. And
And if you've ever been in that situation where you do not think that there's any, any hope, it doesn't take much hope. Are you sharing your hope? First Peter 3.15 But in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord is holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. Are you prepared to make a defense for that hope that is in you. Jesus said, you're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. So if you light your lamp, you're not going to put it under a basket. You're going to put it on a light stand for everyone to see. And when you think about that, that, that glimmer of hope that that servant girl gave Naaman, just a glimmer. Because he was, he was without hope. But that glimmer of hope. Okay? And that light of the world. Uh, I, I looked this up. This is kind of amazing. How far do you think you can see a single candle burning? Any guesses? How much? Three miles. Three miles? That's a good guess. That is a good guess. And that was one of the answers that, that I had. Okay? Now, you have to account for the curve of the earth, okay? In ideal conditions, if you put the candle up high enough on a mountain, no clouds and all that, perfect conditions, you can see the light of that candle for over 30 miles. And they, they did the calculations of how much light and how much light it takes to stimulate you know, and, and there are different conditions. You know, if you've been out on the beach all day under the sun, it's not going to be as far, you know. But how much darkness does it take to hide that candle? There is no darkness that can hide that candle. You know what the most that the biggest limiting factor is of you seeing that candle 30 miles away? The amount of light. It's the other light. If You're not going to see it in the middle of the day. You're not going to see it 30 miles at dusk. You're going to see it when there is absolutely no other light. And for people with no hope, that's what it is. It's darkness. It's blackness. And we're called to be that light. We're called to, sh to share that light, to share that hope in Jesus Christ. And all it takes is a little glimmer of hope. And it stands out. I mean, if you've ever been in, 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 a, in a room where there's abs no windows, absolutely dark, and you light a match, it's, it's almost... It's almost too much after you've been there for a while. Are you sharing the hope of Jesus Christ? Naaman was not only cured of leprosy, but he was a changed man. He says, he came back and told him this. He tried to offer money as, a, as not as a way to buy the cure, but as a, as a thanks for curing it. A thanks to the Lord. And, and, and Elisha said, no, I'm not going to take it. And he said, if you will not, please let me, your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry. Because at the time that they thought, okay, this God lived here. Okay. This is the God of Israel. He can only work in Israel. So let me have some dirt out of your garden so I can take it wherever I want, So you, wherever I go, so I can have that God of Israel with me. Okay? Didn't understand it. 
So he did that. And then he said, okay, when I go down, go in with the king, and, and he bows down, you know, to all these other gods. May the Lord forgive me, you know, because as, as his second, I have to go in there with him and bow down. But I'm not bowing down to that God. I'm bowing down to the God of Israel. He was a changed man. You don't think that, that after, it didn't take much for the word to get around that he was changed. It was a changed life. And I don't know where you are as far as, uh, are you feeling hopeless right now? I don't know. That's up to you and, and God. Okay. But Jesus is the hope. He is your only source of hope. So we, and, and, and Christmas is, you know, you heard it referred to as a lot of things, season of joy, you know, the season of hope, okay, um, whatever other phrases refer to Christmas. The season of hope, as we go out, we know wh- where the hope is. We know who the hope is. So as we go out, and we celebrate Christmas, and we are among others, let's let that light shine. Let's let that glimmer of hope be seen by the rest of the world. Okay? And if you're in one of those situations where, where you don't feel that uh, uh, there is any hope, come and talk to us. I, I, I asked Bob, I told Bob I may do this, I wasn't sure. But if I could get some of the deacons and elders up here as we prepare for this next song. If, if you're going through one of those times where it's like, I have no hope. Okay. Let us pray with you. Let us spend some time with you. We, we, uh, we have uh, a Christian uh, counselor come in, biblical counselor, Anna Marie Rousseau. That, that we'll be happy to talk to you. Because sometimes, because I, I thought, and, and actually, I looked this up, because I'd always heard that, that the, the, the one month of the year where there's more suicides is December. But that's not actually true. It's actually April. And I, I don't know if it has to do with tax season or not. Okay. <laughs> but, but I get to thinking about it. And, and no, you know, there were some theories on why that might be. But I think what it is is when, when, when we go through it and, and we come to Christmas, and, and like I said, people are basing their hope on, on Christmas. It's Christmas. Oh, it's Christmas. Everything will be better because it's Christmas. And, and then we have the new year, so it's a new beginning. Okay? And besides that, and, and you get in January and February, everybody's depressed because it's cold outside, you know, so it's not just me. But it starts warming up, and it, and it seems like the whole world is coming back to life, and things are blooming, and, and people are out and about because it's warmer, and they're happy. And it might be just a little bit, as they do their taxes, it's like, you know what, I'm still in the same place, or I'm worse off. I don't know if that's part of it or not. But it's like, it's not happening for me. There is no hope. In this Christmas season, in this, this time of joy, in this, in this season of hope, let us present that hope to you if you're, if you're struggling and to those around us. Let's pray.